Hello, friends. I'd like to talk today about difficulties, detours, delays, disasters, disabilities. And I think I have just another perspective on why these things happen to us. But before we begin, let's have prayer. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of coming into your presence again. Would you bless us as we consider these things? Give us understanding. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture of reference is uh, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. When these things happen, when the bad things happen, does this mean that God made it happen? Well, consider for a minute. The verse does not say that uh, all bad things are good. What it does say is that God can work them for good. And I like to illustrate it uh, with uh, just re referring to like a couple of people wrestling. One may take a lunge for the other, but then his opponent will grab him and just keep him on going, using his momentum against him. And so it is with the great conflict between Christ and Satan. The enemy of souls is out there trying to destroy, to hurt, to, to cause trouble. But God is able to use whatever the devil puts at us against him for his own glory, for God's own glory. So I would like to explore the possibility that even though bad things are not necessarily ordained by God, they can be definitely used to accomplish his purposes. So it has been said that when you speak in public, tell them three things. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Then tell them. Then, tell them what you told them. So this is going to be my message for today. The difficulties, detours, delays, disasters, and disabilities that we have in our life may not be for our benefit at all, but just might be for somebody else entirely. Look at the case of the man that was born blind. And you can read this in John 9, 1 to 3. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. His purpose for his life was to be blind until Jesus could come and heal him. And it was all for the glory of God. Your difficulties, detours, delays, and disabilities might not be for your benefit. Not to increase your faith, though it could. Not to build your character but it might, not to save your life, but sometimes it does, not to give you any particular blessing, although usually it does. Let me tell you a story. It was about a month ago. I had a delivery in Denver, Colorado, and after I finished, it was a Friday, so I found a place to park at a truck stop. It was near Interstate 70 in Aurora. Well, 
after I got parked and settled in, I decided to go for a walk. I found a I found a Walmart on my phone, on my GPS. And so I walked over there. It was only two miles. It was a good, a nice little walk. And I enjoyed myself. And the day was sunny and bright. And so it was a really good day for walking. And, and it was a pleasurable experience. On the way, I passed an O'Reilly auto parts store. I didn't know it, but I would need that store later. Nevertheless, I got my stuff, I walked back to the truck, and then hoping to find a church in the area, I, I got my trusty little phone out again, and I googled a church, and I found one, and it was only 2.3 miles away. Well, the next morning, I got all dressed up, took my Bible and my cell phone, and headed to church. But when I got there, nobody was there. And I was there after 9.30. Somebody should have been there. But there was a little bit of doubt in my mind because the name on the church wasn't anything like the name that I would have expected for Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, got my phone out, Googled them, got the phone number, called them, and they had moved. All right, so... I headed back to the truck. So, back in the truck, I got my trusty little phone out, and I looked up a sermon video, and I watched that for my church service. I had dinner, laid down for a nap, woke up early afternoon, and I got to thinking, I wonder if there's another church around here. So I googled, there was another church a little over three miles from here. Well, I had a long day left, but I'll just make a Sabbath afternoon walk out of this thing. And I headed out. But when I got there, there was only a public elementary school there. There wasn't a church. And I looked at my phone, my Google map, and I Went around to this side of the church. No. The arrow was right there on the other side of the school. Well, it seemed to be. I looked around. There was no church building there. I walked around to this side of the building, and I, I looked there, and the arrow showed that it was right inside the school building. I said, now that's interesting. Either they meet in the school, or they moved like the other one. Well, whatever the case, struck out a second time. I learned later, I actually talked to the people later, and I learned that they, they actually do meet inside the school. So I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. But, of course, I was there in the afternoon and nothing was going on, so I headed back. On the way back... The road I was on, it's a large thoroughfare, three lanes in each direction, and, and one of those city streets, you know. And as I was headed up the hill, you know how it goes up over the freeway while I was on this rise here, I looked down, and on my left, there was a lady sitting in a walker. What would a lady be doing sitting in a walker in the middle of a vacant lot? It was a graveled lot with some uh, semi-trailers parked there. And it's like there were no houses. So I, thought, I wonder what's the matter with that lady. She, if she's in a walker, she's got some, some difficulty walking, obviously. But she's just sitting there. And I walked around a little bit, and her head was in her hand. And I thought, she's in trouble. So I went down the bankment, and I went up to the lady, and I bent down, and I said, Ma'am, are you in trouble? Do you need help? She was a young lady, probably in her uh, late 20s or early 30s. 
And I asked her, how did you get here? Her response was slow and her speech heavy. She said, I need to go home. I said, how did you get here? My friends left me. Some friends, I thought. Where do you live? By University Hospital. What's your address? I got a pen and paper out of my pocket and began to write. But I couldn't understand her house number. So I said, what was that again? She tried again. And again. And every time the number was different. Finally, she got exasperated with me. And she said, it's near the university hospital. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me look that up. So I got my trusty little phone out and I looked it up. University Hospital. It was seven miles. So I think it was like 7.1 miles. And I thought to myself, boy, that'd be a good stiff walk for me, let alone for this lady. There's no way she can go seven miles walking. If she has to have a walker, she could not go seven miles. So I knew that that wasn't an option. So I said, do you mind if I call for some help someone to give you a ride okay so i call the 911 operator and the lady answered and uh, i said ma'am there's a lady here out in the middle of a vacant lot there's no houses around here I don't know how she got here. She's in a walker. She's sitting there and she clearly needs some help. Her speech is thick and almost incoherent. And she needs to get a ride home or something. And the operator said, I'm connecting you to the paramedics. Explain your situation to them. So I told my story again. Where are you? I think I'm on Chambers as it crosses Interstate 70 in Aurora. What do you see around you? Well, let's see, there's a, over here, there's an office building. And then there's uh, Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, Arco Gas Station. And on the other side of the street, there's, there's a, a a large indoor storage facility, a U-Haul storage. And she said, okay, stay on the line. Don't hang up. They're on their way and they're using your cell phone to track your location. They're almost there, she continued. They're almost there. And she said, is she vomiting? No. Don't let her drink anything. Okay. Pretty soon I heard the sirens. Here came a fire truck followed by an ambulance. And they came to a stop. The ambulance parked. And the, the firemen jumped out of their truck. They all came down. There were four of them. Dressed in black. And the ambu two ambulance people came out and they were dressed in white <laughs> and they came down the hill and uh, so I told the operator I said well they're here now she said okay I'm gonna go ahead and hang up so she hung up and they took charge right now they came in was asking this lady questions and stuff like that and they were all standing around there and so I said, uh, now that you're here, you don't need me anymore, do you? No, thanks for your help. You can go. And as I walked back to the truck, I began to think about all that had happened that day. 
two closed churches. Other issues. A sudden urge to go for another walk. Could this all have been designed by God to get me right there, right then, for that lady? With all the traffic going by, who could have seen her down there? If I had been driving by, I wouldn't have seen, and if I had perchance looked, what would I have done? I wouldn't even have given it a second thought. I would have just kept going, maybe. But that's not all. Sunday, the next day, I decided that I needed to start the truck. And after all, I'd had the, the truck shut down for a day. And I wanted to get it started. To You know, you kind of have to keep the battery run up because you run things off the you know, off the batteries. So I went to start it and it wouldn't start. Oh no, the truck won't start. And then I ran the batteries down thinking, oh, maybe a little bit. Maybe a little. Oh, no, it quit. It was, they were dead. So I thought, oh man, I can't call a service truck today. That would be weekend charges and that would be a lot of money. So Monday, the next day, I got my cell phone out and I, I Googled truck service shops or whatever. And, and uh, it showed some, and one of them was like one tenth of a mile <laughs> from where I was at. And so I went out in the parking lot of the truck stop in the entryway and I looked around and I looked at the truck stop, oh, maybe it's in here somewhere, maybe they have a shop. And so I called these guys that were right close. And I said, where are you guys at? They said, well, where are you at? I said, well, I'm at the Flying J truck stop. Well, are you facing the truck stop? Yes, turn around. We're across the street. <laughs> there they were. So I uh, went over there. And I walked in and I said, what would you charge to to take a service truck across the road to jumpstart my truck? I got a dead battery. $100 for the pickup. Well, okay. Plus $25 if we have to hook it up to the analyzer. And he added, plus $185 for me to go do it per hour, minimum one hour. I said, that's $300. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I said, nobody pays me that kind of money. He said, well, you never ask. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'd probably lose my job too. Well, whatever the case, I said, uh, I'll have to think about this. So I, I left and I went back across the road and on the way I said, Lord, what do I do? And just then a thought came to me. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You might not believe this, but I firmly believe that when we talk to God and we get those impressions in our minds, that's his talking back to us. This happens regularly. And if we just listen, he's trying to help us. So the next thing that I thought was this. Buy a set of jumper cables. It will be cheaper, and you'll have something left over for your investment. <laughs> Voila! So I headed out for Rayleigh's, a couple miles over there. Now, I did measure from the battery box to the front of the truck, and it was 25 feet. And I figured if somebody is going to be helping me, they They'll, I'll need more than 25 feet, probably 35 feet to connect to their trucks. So I thought, well, okay. So I was, I was figuring I'd need 35 to 40 feet of jumper cable. Well, I got over there and the jumper cables were, had a, a nice set designed for large trucks. 20 foot cable for uh, the neighborhood of $50. 
so I bought two of them. It seems like I paid $119. I'm, I'm not sure with taxes and all that stuff. So I got my two cables. And they're nice cables. They'll last me a long time. So I headed home. And I got to thinking, wait a minute, you know, I spent less than half of what it would have cost me to have that service call. And I got jumper cables out of the deal as well. So I felt pretty good about my purchase. On the way back to the truck, I passed a couple of uh, empty warehouses. We're talking huge warehouses with a whole line of uh, loading docks, totally empty. And I thought, wait a minute, you know what? This would be a whole lot nicer to sit here instead of in that crowded truck stop. It would be quiet. And I could just be here instead of over there. So on my way back, I planned to do just that. And I got running. Boy, was I thankful. By the way, I had to do a little a fuel line repair. The fuel, fill the... Uh, fuel filter with fuel and uh, make sure I, I bled out the fuel pump, make sure that was okay. But I got the truck going and I was so relieved. But when I was ready, I pulled out of the truck stop and I went back to that warehouse and I pulled in there and I backed into one of those stalls and just as if I was loading, I was just parked there. As I was sitting there, I left the truck running because I didn't, I want to make sure the battery is good and charged and I didn't, I knew I'd be a whole lot worse off if I couldn't get it started there. So I left it running. And as I was sitting there, I looked across the way to the neighboring warehouse and there was a line of trailers there and there was a truck trying to back into one of those empty stalls. And he wasn't coming around. You know, typically you've got to bring your trailer around. He wasn't bringing his trailer around. It was going to run into that other trailer. I laid on my horn, wah! And he stopped just like that. You learn. When you're in a truck, you're moving in tight spaces and you hear a horn, you stop. Well, he was smart. He stopped when he heard my horn. And I jumped out and I ran over there. And I said, you know, you're going to run into that trailer over there. You better pull ahead and give it another shot. He said, will you flag me? I said, sure. So I went back there and I guided him a little bit. But his angle wasn't exactly right and he needed to take another pull ahead. So I ran it up to him and I explained it to him. And he said, don't leave me. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to leave you. He said, this is my first time. And I said, I'll stay here till you get situated. So we worked at that until finally he got his tractor straight around. He could see down both sides of his trailer. And after that, it's easy. So, so I went my way. And I sat in my truck again, and I got to thinking about that. He dropped the trailer. He left. And I got to thinking, you know what? I was right there, right then, for him. Now, what about breaking down and all this other gobbledygook uh, that I had to go through? What about all that? Was that planned? I'm not ready to say that that was a coincidence in my mind. It had the fingerprints of God all over it. Coincidence? You want to call it coincidence? That's your business. But those were two incidents the same weekend in which difficult circumstances put me at the right place at the right time to help the people that needed some help. Now, <laughs> the next day, got to tell you the third thing that happened. The next day after I had 
uh, gotten a load up to Nebraska and unloaded there and headed out. I was headed home this time and I was going along Interstate 80 and over on my left side on the other side of the freeway there was a car broke down. It was a little white car with its hood up. The man was under the hood and I thought to myself, I don't have a schedule. I think I'll just stop and see what the deal is. So I pulled over and I, I uh, watched for traffic and ran across the highway and and I asked, I asked him what the deal was. And the lady in the driver's seat seemed to be a little more in charge. And I think it was her car. She talked like it was her car. She said, my clutch goes out on me. I have to pump it and then it'll work again. But I left my pliers and I don't have anything to open the valve with. I said, well, I've got some wrenches. So I came back with some tools. And I handed him a wrench and he opened the valve and she started pumping her clutch and he closed the valve and she said, it still doesn't work. She said, I've got two babies in New Mexico and I'm trying to get over there. I said, well, let me try. So this time I took my wrench and I said, now when we do this, I'll tell you when, but you'll need to push it down and wait until I tell you to pull it back up again. Then wait until I tell you to push it down again. So I opened the valve. She pushed it down. I closed the valve. Pull up. So she pulled it up. I opened the valve. Push down. She pushed it down. I closed the valve. Let it up. She let it up. And we did that about four times. And when I got done with the fourth time, only there was there had been air coming out. Now there was just a steady stream of uh, fluid. I said, I said, let's try that. So she pressed on it. She said, it works. <laughs> so I gathered up my tools and I wasn't paying attention to anything. And a sheriff had pulled up behind the lady and she ran back to talk to him. And I went around that way and she said, he didn't do anything. <laughs> so, uh, so I said, yeah, the only thing I did was I crossed the freeway, but I don't do it unless, unless there's nobody coming. And he said, all right, be careful. So I went, go, I, so I went back and I was on my way again. Now, how many of these little episodes were designed by God? It seemed like every single one of them was scheduled. And I had a lot of thinking to do. You know what? So many times we think that the things that happen to us are for our benefit. If I do this, if I make that decision, it'll save my life. It will, you know, do this for me, do that for me. And we can look back on many of the events of our life and see that indeed these difficulties, detours, delays, disasters, and disabilities were for our benefit. But sometimes, and that's the lesson for today, sometimes these things are not for us at all. It's for the next guy. Well, that's a neat idea. I hadn't thought about that. Well, one of my favorite illustrations I've heard a number of times, and you probably have too. You remember when Alexander the Great was, he came to a city that was built on a precipice, a very defendable location. And as he was there beneath the walls of that city, he called for the surrender of the city. And the people said, what makes you think you can take our city? So he turned to his troops, had them fall into ranks, and he began marching them toward the precipice. And the first few ranks marched off to their death, and he halted. And he turned back to them and he said, I'm calling for your surrender. They surrendered. Why did they surrender? Because they knew that those soldiers had a dedication that could not be defeated. And here's the point I want to make in all this. Who won that battle that day? 
It was those first few that had marched off to their death. They died for the taking of that city. If they had fought the battle, they would have faced the same risk. But they didn't have to fight the battle because they were willing to march in obedience to their commander to their death. Now, what's interesting about all this is history does not record the names of those who lost their lives in the taking of that city. But we do know the name of their general. You and I, we, are not the center of the universe. In the end, when sin has finally been conquered, we may not be remembered for any losses that we may have suffered. No, our sufferings will mean very little by then. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus alone will shine as the great hero for all eternity. So why do we complain when stuff goes wrong? You and I are just cannon fodder, collateral damage. In the great controversy between good and evil, and if God should choose me to suffer, if I should be called to fail somehow, that others might succeed. To fall, that others might rise. To die, that others might live. What an honor. Folks, do you realize how many there are that when the going gets tough, they cut loose and run? Life is not about you, and it's not about me. It's all about the kingdom of God, his glory, his plan, his sacrifice. You've got losses, sins, difficulties? Join the club. Last I checked, if you were born on planet Earth, you've got losses, you've got sins, you've got difficulties. So does everybody else around you. That should give us a sense of comfort, knowing that we're not alone. We're not the only ones. A sense of camaraderie, knowing we share in the same struggle. A sense of sympathy, knowing that others also have pain. Ellen White said it this way in chapter 13 of that classic, Steps to Christ. I'm going to read it for you. Angels are listening to hear what kind of report you are bearing to the world about your heavenly master. Let your conversation be of him who liveth to make intercession for you before the Father. When you take the hand of a friend, let praise to God be on your lips and in your heart. This will attract his thoughts to Jesus. All have trials, griefs hard to bear, temptations hard to resist. Do not tell your troubles to your fellow mortals, but carry everything to God in prayer. Make it a rule never to utter one word of doubt or discouragement. You can do much to brighten the life of others and strengthen their efforts by words of hope and holy cheer. There is many a brave soul, sorely pressed by temptation, almost ready to faint in the conflict with self and with the powers of evil. Do not discourage such a one in his hard struggle. Cheer him with brave, hopeful words that shall urge him on his way. Thus the light of Christ may shine from you. None of us liveth to himself, Romans 14, 7. By our unconscious influence, others may be encouraged and strengthened, or they may be discouraged and repelled from Christ and the truth. I like one I heard years ago. There's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us. It hardly behooves any of us to talk about the rest of us. I hope that my stories have given a new perspective on what it means.
to suffer for Christ. I hope you have been encouraged to renew your faith in Jesus, to trust him with everything. Your things, your finances, your livelihood, your children, your life, your soul. Do you trust him? Job lost all that he had, yet he could still say, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And I'm just asking, even if your difficulties are not specifically for your benefit, are you willing to suffer for Jesus in this way? Do you trust him? Dear Father, again we come. We thank you for the energy you've given to us and, and the renewed purpose to simply submit to the purposes of God, to your circumstances, your providence, your leading. Dear God, we give our lives into your hands. Thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, folks. Thank you.